Hey guys, um, so today we are going to go to Jeremiah chapter 3. And so let's open up in prayer. Lord Jesus, you are amazing. We worship you. We magnify you. We invite you into this study with us and ask that you would just take control. God, I'm praying right now that you would anoint me to speak your word. That you would give me the words to say. And let me know what to say. Open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. That you would draw us back to you, God. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Okay. Chapter 3 of Jeremiah, verse 1. They say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's. Shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Wow. So God is saying that if a man divorces his wife because she committed adultery and then she goes out and finds another man do you think her first husband would take her back afterwards no and god is saying but you i divorced you for adultery and you went out and found all these people to sleep with, commit adultery with. But I want you back. Anybody who tells you that the Old Testament is just a God of judgment has not ever actually read the Old Testament. We find and we're going to find that God is utterly broken. From what his people have done to him and he has done nothing but be patient continue to cry out send prophets and they kill the prophets try he does everything possible and beyond before he actually brings the judgment verse 2 lift up your eyes unto the high places and see where you have not been lain with Where didn't you sleep with somebody? In the ways you have sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness and you have polluted the land with your whoredoms and with your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withholden. I'm not sending rain. I'm not going to let it rain. And there has been no latter rain. And you had a whore's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. A lot of times in the Old Testament, you see, um, you know, sometimes if a woman was a prostitute, she would have a veil and cover her face. Nope. God said you had a whore's forehead. Your face was shown. You didn't care. No shame. Verse 4. Will thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, you are the guide of my youth. After all that's happened to you. After how miserable you are for leaving me. Won't you cry out to me? 5. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou could. Whatever thing 
you found to do. You did it. Whatever you could. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up on every high mountain, under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and gave her a bill of divorcement. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So Judah is looking at Israel. Israel was the worst and it was the first to fall and go into captivity. And Judah saw, Judah saw what happened when you first say God and watch them be taken away, watch everything crumble. And then said, hey, let's go do that. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and stocks, okay, tree trunks. And yet, verse 10, and yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. So fake, pretend. That is the worst. Because he goes on in verse 11 to say, And the Lord has said to me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. At least Israel had the guts to not hide it from me. It was shameful and disgusting that she just had no shame for what she did and put it all out there. But remember um, in uh, Revelation, Jesus said, I would rather have you hot or cold, not lukewarm. And so here we have Judah pretending to be godly, going through the motions, looking the part. We talked about that, acting the part but being fake in their heart. It was all for show. And like God wasn't supposed to know. Have you ever had that? Someone that you love dearly. Being fake nice to you for show. It was, it was a game the whole time. The whole time. So they could still benefit off of you. That's what Judah was doing. Verse 12, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Verse 13, only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your ways to the strangers under every green tree and you have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. That's what you would want when someone's doing something wrong and there's betrayal involved. God's saying, come back to me and, and own up, own up to what you did, man up to what you did. Verse 14, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married to you. Now watch, earlier, verse 8, he said, I wrote him a bill of divorcement. Now he's saying, I, I'm married to you in his heart. 
Like he had to do this. This was something that he had to do. He knew. He had to step away for his own good. But he didn't want to. He was still married to her in his heart. I am married to you and I will take you. One of a city and two of a family and I will bring you to Zion. That's Jerusalem. Verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. So there's coming a time when people aren't going to go to Jerusalem to seek the Ark of the Covenant because God himself will be there. It is the best thing of all. Hallelujah, Jesus. When we no longer look for the trinkets and the treasures and the things, but we look for God himself. He is the treasure. Verse 17, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered unto it. To the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. So he's going to fully reunite the kingdom, take the two sides and make them one. Hallelujah. Verse 19. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children? And give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage in the host of nations. And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shall not turn away from me. Surely, as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their ways. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Verse 23, Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame has devoured the work of our fathers from our youth. Their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters, we lie down in our shame. And our confusion covers us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. Hallelujah. That is Jeremiah speaking. As the prophet, he is interceding for the people and confessing their sins. Daniel did this also. And I want to tell you that it is an immensely powerful thing to be an intercessor and to intercede for people. Um, and just pray for them. You know, um, I want to share an idea with you that's so powerful. Um, really in the vein of being an intercessor, they say standing in the gap. That's just um, praying for someone who is away from God or not in right standing with God. 
And so there were times um, in the Bible times that all the land was divided up and there, you know, were had like fences around the property. And sometimes um, there might be, you know, a park that's broken down. And so thieves can get in wild animals and cause a lot of damage. And so when you stand in that gap, you are standing there. There'd be someone that would come and guard it until they were able to come fix it and make it better. So we stand in the gap and protect these people and pray for their souls, plead for their salvation until God comes in. Hallelujah. And so, um, you know, I want to share this idea with you because the Lord gave it to me and extremely powerful. You know how um, the Bible tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So he goes before God and he accuses us, reminds God of all the things that we've done wrong. Two can play that game. You know? So... If the devil can remind God of everything someone has done wrong, we can remind God of everything someone's done right. So what I started to do is I took um, examples. I took um, the man that I love and our two boys, and I made lists of all the good that I know that they've done. And, um, and I will go to God with these lists and I will remind him of them and pray and say, this is why they're worth saving. This is why. And um, if we can just say, God, you know, if you know someone that's even lost their way, maybe they're not doing right anymore. They've still done right in their life. And that's what you hit on. And you can say, God, I'm not here coming into your courts and I'm not here to tell you how right they are because they're not. None of us are. Um, but if they can do right when they had all this trouble going on, imagine the right that they'll do when their heart is right with you. And you remind God why he chose them, why he saved them. And in the doing that, it strengthens the love in your own heart for them. When you get the heart of the Father in you for them, and you fight and you plead for souls. Because if the devil has access to God, we need to be up there fighting too for the people that we love. And we can see how God was continually going, turn backsliding children, turn. He was continually pleading for them. And so we can plead before God for their souls, for him to reach them. Only God knows what it's going to take. But we still stand in the gap. We still pray and plead for their souls. No matter what, look at how much they did. And they ran out on God and did all this stuff and he still wanted them back, still pleading for them to return. He had divorced them and left them and walked away. He didn't want to. He didn't want to send judgment. And he stalled and did everything he possibly could to not do it. And so we need to have that type of love for people, for souls. And understand the heart of God in this issue. Be praying for others and standing in that gap. So that is all for today. That's the chapter. Thank you so much for joining me. And I hope you have a great night. Bye-bye.